Especially in NMR, besides niobium and titanium, we need material which enable us to go to higher magnetic fields. Higher magnetic fields above 10 Tesla. Fields close to the 20 Tesla regime, and that can all be done with the A15 conductors. For this purpose, we developed the so-called bronze route. Bronze is a material which is very cold hardening during drawing, which means we have to do a lot of heat treatments to get it always soft enough so that it is not too brittle to draw the wire further down to the smaller diameters. One can do the most wonderful mechanical working of conductors such that you can make several thousand filament conductors of niobium 310 where in spite of the fact that this material is extremely brittle, as brittle as glass, uh, in fact you can make strong, tough conductors out of this because what you do is fabricate the material and then only at the final size, by heating the material and allowing a diffusion reaction to take place, uh, do you form the desired superconducting phase. All those materials of the A15 family, in particular the Obium 310, I mean, it is made in reasonable amounts, like, like several tons a year, but it is still a unique process. Every billet of, of the Obium 310, every piece of wire you order, is, is something really special. It's a unique product that is made for that specific application. Now the spool is taken out of the furnace and what is seen here is also a test length of a brass conductor. So as you can see, the, the conductor is annealed and it's now clear, no oxidation on the surface. And it's now soft and ready for further strengthening due to drawing process. As you can see, the outer part of the wire is consistent of uh, copper, this is the outer sheath. Then you have this barrier and inside are distributed the 23,000 filaments. Now opium tin conductors looking from outside like a copper wire because for protection, for electrical protection, we need to have a, a, some amount of copper in the area and if this is above 25 percent then we have to have the copper on an outer shell which is then protected from the tin by a tantalum barrier as the copper needs to have a very good conductivity not to be spoiled by any tin coming from the bronze to get us good layers of niobium 3 tin getting us good critical current. Typical heat treatments for commercial superconducting wires uh, are isothermal. There's a relatively slow heating rate and after that there's a long isothermal treatment. This is far from ideal for maintaining a uniformity of superconducting wires. The variation of layer thickness will be reflected in poor superconducting properties, critical temperature and critical current for the final conductor. Crystallography allows you to determine the degree of atomic ordering and the degree of atomic ordering is directly correlated to Tc and to Bc2 and of course to the critical current density. Because you have the capability of manipulating the temperature at which you do this, you could go very high. If you go very high, what happens is the grains of the A15, the niobium 3 tin phase which is growing, become very big. They perhaps become half a micron or a micron. You soon discover that if you do that, you don't have as much current as you would like or the magnet builder would like to have. So what you do is you keep the temperature down and you find that you can get the grains perhaps as small as 100 nanometers. The difficulty is that when you do this, you trade off uh, the amount of tin that you put into the filaments uh, against the grain size. That in and of itself offers many interesting opportunities still for study. It is made in reasonable amounts, like, like several tons a year, but it is still a unique process. Every billet of, of Niobium 310, every piece of wire you order, is, is something really special. It's a unique product that is made for that specific application. So in terms of large volume, it, it is never going to be cheap. Not easy to reproduce because the manufacturer is not used to do it like 10 times or so. He's only making every product once. The red one is the sun, which is where the eddy current testing is done. And what we've done here is the, it's the wire which is coming inside a machine, going through the sun and then going to the next pool. The clones are flowing in the eddy current testing around this sheath here and depending on the frequency you can detect what is happening, what's going on 
inside the conductor and any fault will disturb the distribution of current and will make the uh, characteristic signal. Yeah, yeah. 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 The whole story about the niobium 3 tin conductors is simply said how to get as much as possible tin into the niobium to get high current densities into the conductor. If we're looking to A15 materials, then we see there are many different solutions and the bronze route which we're talking about now is only one of them. But the bronze route has been shown to be the stable solution for NMR magnets. NMR magnets which have to be run in persistent mode. And without that, we cannot have the use of this material for NMR. Other wires, uh, internal tin, uh, jelly roll conductors, powder and tube conductors have higher current densities than the bronze conductors, but they are not as reliable in larger quantities. Therefore, we will see continuous need and use of bronze root conductors. Optimization of bronze root conductors is a relatively straightforward issue because the bronze matrix is a single phase you only ever have the alpha phase, the copper tin solid solution. Internal tin conductors are very much more complicated. The um, many phases will be present because of the higher tin concentration. And modeling this from first principles is a, a daunting task. A more experimental technique gives us some potential to attack this issue. We're measuring here the voltage um, as a function of time during a multi-step heat treatment. Um, which can of course be converted to the resistance of the wire because we're applying a constant current. And the, the measurements of resistometry allow us to see how we can detect the variation in properties during heat treatment of these complex multi-phase systems. It depends very much if you have a lot of tin, then you will be closer to this line. If you have less tin, you will be closer far away, that means you will end up with another composition. And the formation condition, the thermodynamics of formation is different. And the formation condition, the thermodynamics of formation is different. So with modeling and calculations in computers, we're not constrained by the requirements for a simple multi-step isothermal heat treatment. We can consider sinusoidal variations of temperature, a series of ramps and dwells, to really optimize the properties. Our modelling allows us to predict the distribution of niobium protein layer thickness and matrix composition for any combination of these heat treatments. Niobium protein is a very, very interesting and a very performing product. Uh, it is uh, more difficult than niobium titanium from the production point of view. Uh, but it is very performing, so you can produce high fields and high currents uh, with this kind of uh, wire. With this wire, we produced uh, uh, this kind of cable, a uh, 1080 wires cable, uh, able to carry 80,000 amps at 12 Tesla 4.2K. So, uh, very, very performing cable. Now one has to choose. If you want to make a magnet of 12 Tesla, it will be in any case advantageous to do internal tin of powder and tube. If you want to make 21 Tesla, then you will make it very probably on bronze. Today there is no real answer to that. In all types of niobium treating conductors, superconducting layers are brittle after high temperature action between niobium and tin. Moreover, a coil is made of several materials which have a different thermal expansion coefficients. There are two distinct approaches for making niobium treating magnets. The first one is react and wind, where one needs firstly react the conductor, then insulate this, usually by continuous coating techniques, and then wind the coil. In the react and wind approach, one must wind the coil with the brittle pre-reacted niobium treating conductor, which is prone to significant degradation. In the second type, in the wind rack technique, one needs firstly insulate the wire with the material which will sustain high temperature diffusion process of niobium 3 tin. The insulating process can be time consuming and expensive. <laughs> the
then one may wind the coil and react entire coil package. The wind and react approach may result in large accumulated strain in the ends of the magnet. Magnet with the complex and geometries are more prone to degradation, damage due to large local strain. In conclusion, wind and react may be safe choice for short research and development magnets, but the ultimate goal of making long production magnets, the react and wind approach appears to be more promising. At the moment we are not putting inside the company so much resources on the on the research like HTS or magnesium deborite application. We are following very carefully and if something happens on that area, so we are ready to, to jump in, in there also. But now we are focusing on niobium titanium and niobium 3T.